Welcome to Conservation Conversations with me, Sean O'Brien, the President and CEO of NatureServe. I'm coming to you this month from the Van Humboldt, which is the vehicle I've been driving around this year to visit with our partners across Canada and the United States who collect the data on the amazing biodiversity on our continent. Since starting Conservation Conversations, I've introduced you to scientists, authors, and conservation leaders who have shared their stories about their vital work in conservation. Together, we have learned about the impacts of the global climate crisis, the public health ramifications of biodiversity loss, and about threats to worldwide food systems, and more. As 2021 comes to a close, we decided to go back and review past conversations and prepare a special episode for you, a sort of best of collection of moments that made me pause and think more deeply or go, huh, that's interesting, or otherwise intrigued me and the staff at NatureSurf. We're thankful for the conversations we've had with all the guests on the show who inspire us by advancing positive environmental change. We hope these clips will inspire you too. In the first part of this episode, we'll hear about the importance of conserving biodiversity. What's humanity's role as part of nature, how we are causing the sixth extinction, and how we can connect to biodiversity on a personal level. We started off our conservation conversation series by talking to Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, Known as the godfather of biodiversity, he is one of the most important thought leaders in biodiversity conservation. Tom is also a senior fellow at the United Nations Foundation and a professor of environmental science and policy at George Mason University. I'd love to hear some story about when you were first getting started and going out in the field. What was it like back then? Because I think in many ways, it wasn't that much different than what Darwin experienced more than 100 years earlier. And at that point, the Amazon was essentially 97% intact. Right. And imagine right. that. Right? An area as big as the 48 states and 97% intact. And of course, it was just brimming with all kinds of biological diversity, a lot of it undescribed. And um, I never looked back. It was like, you know, it was like, so I'd like to say it's like being in a biologist equivalent of a Christmas stocking with no end to it. <laughs> yeah, and it is remarkable to think about 97% intact and just how much has been lost that we don't know we have lost because it was never cataloged. True. And that, that is really terrifying. We just don't know what's out there. Um, so that's, that is, of course, one of the things that we're trying to do now at NatureServe is catalog uh, the biodiversity of at least the Americas, which is our primary service area. Uh, but even that, even just in North America, that's very difficult because we constantly discover new species, um, even, even here in the United States. And um, then finding someone who can actually do research on them and discover what, they, what their life story is, is very challenging. That's right, and there are these huge knowledge frontiers like soil biodiversity, right? Yeah. Totally essential to how everything else works, uh, but mostly sort of overlooked and forgotten. And when you think about the prairie soil systems and the root systems of those grasses, which went down 12, 14 feet, uh, accumulating just immense stores of carbon, which John Deere's plow, of course, made available for a fairly wasteful form of agriculture that we practice. We lost a lot of that soil carbon. When you get beyond the vertebrates uh, and maybe well-known gro groups like butterflies or, or something like that, uh, there is just so much still to be discovered. Absolutely. You know, what people, mostly are unaware of is that anything we call an environmental problem, we call it that because it affects living systems, which means that biodiversity integrates all the environmental problems. Uh, so trying to do something for biodiversity means you have to address all of them, not just the things that affect biodiversity directly like a bulldozer, <laughs> but uh, acid rain or whatever it might be. So there's no better measure of 
the sustainability of the planet and the state of its biodiversity. In my conversation with Tom, he talked about how while we still have so much natural world left to discover, we're running out of time to appreciate what exists and how to conserve it. Tom reminded us that our actions directly impact biodiversity and that we should care because our own well-being is tied to biodiversity, also that we should just care about protecting nature. That we're inseparably linked to the natural world should be clear by now, and yet we still need the science, data, and analyses, nature serves strong suit, to show this. For effective conservation, we also need an emotional hook to get people and governments to take the necessary steps to conserve nature. Andrea Wolf, the award-winning biographer of Alexander von Humboldt, beautifully put this idea into words in the following clip. I think I was taught wrongly and I was always given this idea like you either like the arts or you like the sciences. And, uh, and I think in the environmental, um, it's one, I, I would actually say it's one of the very few areas um, where, where people do talk about their emotional response to nature. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's important because in the end of the day, we're only going to protect what we love. So we need to make people fall in love with nature. There's no way around it. If we want them to protect nature, you have to talk about the wonder of nature. It's just, it's been, it's just like, been forbidden in a way you know if you do scientific work and you know it's not emotional it's not passionate but i i my guess is that most scientists um went into this work because they have a love for nature you know they have you know there's there's this kind of deep sense of curiosity how the world works and it's if you think about it it's a very recent distinction this distinction between the arts and the sciences um Think of some, someone like Leonardo da Vinci, for example. And of course, Alexander von Humboldt was, was an amazing artist. Part of the reason that we're talking today is that NatureServe is starting a, uh, an, a new adventure. We're, we're getting ready to head out into the, the wilds of the United States and Canada to visit with natural heritage programs to try and help people make the connection to nature right here in the backyard in the United States. And uh, we're referring to this as the Van Humboldt tour. Well, I, I think it's great. And I think, you know, it, 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 Humboldt is in, in different aspects, very relevant to, to, to what you're trying to do. But also he was a great science communicator. He, of course, doesn't invent nature, but he invents the way we understand nature. He's really the one who says, this is all one big living organism. Everything's connected from the tiniest insect to the tallest tree. This recurring theme that we're all connected, that humans are dependent on biodiversity and biodiversity is affected by humans, is more important now than ever. In this next segment, Michelle Nyhouse shares what's at stake if we don't start taking action to prevent the mass extinction event currently underway. This geologic scale event is happening in our lifetimes. Michelle is the author of the wonderful book, Beloved Beasts, Fighting for Life in the Age of Extinction, a topic which is important to us here at NatureServe and to everyone. The subtitle of the book talks about extinction. And as you get towards the conclusion of the book, you're talking about the sixth extinction. And I talk about the sixth extinction a lot, but can you, do you have a succinct way of describing the sixth extinction for the listeners? It's the, uh, the idea that we have had five mass extinctions on the planet already, including the one that, that killed the dinosaurs. And many scientists uh, believe given the, especially given the dramatic declines in numbers or, or abundance of certain species, we are on the, on the brink or we are entering a sixth extinction. The difference with this one being that it is primarily caused by human activities. Yeah. And I have a hard time sometimes talking with people about the fact, well, it could very well be already happening. And yet we can still save many species that we care about. Yeah. So, you know, another thing that you've written about a bit is um, climate change. And of course, this all is part and parcel um, the climate change and the effect on the sixth extinction and on species and ecosystems. I mean, one of my, I had a lot of motivations for writing this book, but one of my motivations was a sense that uh, there's an enormous interest uh, as well. There should be among younger generations in climate activism. 
uh, but conservation has it doesn't get as much of a ten, as much attention from youth activists as climate change. And I I hoped to show that conservation is is still in, incredibly important and and so intertwined with climate. We've heard from several guests who've described why it's important to understand and connect with biodiversity, and we've also heard the sense of urgency in their voices. In addition to why, one of the most challenging questions in conservation is how can we best achieve our conservation goals? In the next part of today's episode, we're revisiting a conversation with Dr. Don Wright, who is the chief scientist at Esri. Esri is the company that creates geographic information system software that allows us to map and better understand our natural world. Don underlined the importance of maps and data when working to save species and ecosystems. You also mentioned when you were talking about these data layers, uh, one of the things that's particularly interesting about them is that they're being made available as open data for other people to use, the, the predictor layers on habitat. And I'm a little interested in um, Esri's position on open data and, uh, you know, the idea that data wants to be free um, mm -hmm. and how you're thinking about that in terms of, like, yes, data wants to be free and we make things available and people discover all sorts of interesting things, but people also have to pay for the acquisition, you know, for, to create the data mm -hmm. and to make the data available and sort of thinking about that balance is uh, something that we are working with a lot at NatureServe. Yes, well, we have uh, an open uh, data initiative. Uh, in fact, it's wonderful because uh, the map of biodiversity importance is now uh, built into our ArcGIS hub product, which actually a uh, hub originated from our ArcGIS for open data, coming from our open data initiative with the idea of especially for data sets that have been collected with taxpayer dollars, Mm -hmm. uh, for federal agencies and uh, also state and local government agencies to a lesser extent, that is already the people's data. Uh, and that, that data should be freely available. It should not only be freely available, but it should be in formats that are easy for people to access and to understand. It's, we want the data to come alive in a map form so that people can actually see, see the context. And so that's why uh, the map of biodiversity importance uh, hub, uh, we think is so very helpful there. It's also those data layers are tied into our living atlas of the world. This is essentially a global GIS that's being created before our eyes. The data that we collect at NatureServe and through the NatureServe network is widely recognized as the gold standard for understanding where imperiled species are. We work with conservation partners such as ESRI and the International Union for the Conser Conservation of Nature to organize and curate large databases that allow us to track the conservation status of plants, animals, and ecosystems. Our friend and former colleague at NatureServe, Dr. Tom Brooks, now chief scientist of the IUCN's Science and Knowledge Unit, talked with us about how the IUCN works with NatureServe to protect biodiversity. Um, to date, um, the, the, the Red List has um, assessed extinction risk for more than 130,000 species around the world. Um, and in total, um, about a quarter of those um, 130,000 or th so species um, have been assessed as, as threatened with a high risk of extinction um, in the medium term, in the medium term future. Nature serves role um, has has been is and continues to be an absolutely fundamental one in 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 red listing uh, over the decades. Um, the G the G ranking system implemented um, um, across the Nature Serve network is in effect the 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 manifestation of extinction risk um, assessment within the North American context and is very much designed to be interoperable to interlock with uh, with 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 the IUCN red list. Um, that's um, that's not just been fundamental for North America, but I'd actually say also, um, in fact, across the entire of the Western Hemisphere, um, NatureServe um, has played absolutely central roles in in advancing red listing um, Americas wide. Um, for example, for amphibians uh, with the with the global amphibian assessment, and then on on assessment of reptile extinction risk. 
the resulting knowledge is fundamental for guiding decisions. It doesn't determine decisions. It doesn't mean if a species is threatened, then a given action has to happen. But rather, it's it's to, to support informing and guiding decisions towards sustainability. Um, obviously, that's very much the case in conservation programs themselves, in implementation of, of conservation actions. Mm-hmm. Um, but also um, increasingly important in guiding decisions in the in, across society as a whole. So guiding decisions in the private sector, guiding decisions uh, by financial institutions, um, um, lending institutions, and so on. Um, guiding decision making by by um, regional governments, local communities, indigenous peoples, such that decisions can be made, actions carried out in ways. Um, that help to reduce the risk of species extinction. We've now heard a few examples about how biodiversity data are used to make real positive changes in conservation. Some listeners may be wondering how they can make a difference in this field if they're not contributing to data collection or science directly. In my conversation with Congressman Don Beyer, we were reminded about the power that we as individuals have to promote biodiversity conservation. And John, we're so lucky in America and in the world to have NatureServe that keeps uh, these biodiversity databases you know, so uh, meticulously and so well researched with so many different um, de- detection resources. Um, you, you give us the information we need to make sure that we're, we're acting in the right ways, in the right places, and moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. You know, we we are affecting people in a sort of fascinating ways. I, um, there's a little country club in Alexandria where we play golf. And in a recent newsletter that the, the golf course groundskeeper talked about creating corridors um, for the, the foxes and the coyotes and, um, That's great. And, and habitat for the different birds that they want there. And so uh, you don't have to be running um, nature serve. Yeah, you can be at, at at a very different level and still be invested in trying to make a difference. You know, uh, I've often believed that the most important part of trying to be a leader on any given issue is raising your hand. And so I try to raise my hand for endangered species. The power we all have in raising our hands, using our voices, casting our votes, and standing up for biodiversity is a fundamental right that we should all feel excited and responsible to exercise. However, not everyone has the same opportunity to exercise that right. In the next clip, I spoke with scientist and conservation advocate, Dr. Peter Shoria of the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field of conservation. Uh, But you have other things that you're involved in, in the science world. Uh, You work in community or citizen science, and you're also uh, really interested in the important issue of diversity and equity and in this field, um, we don't see a lot of um, people of color in the in the conservation field in the United States and Canada, anyway. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I'm curious, like, what's what's your experience with that, and what do you think we can do? Like, how can we increase uh, diversity in this field? Yeah, that was, I think, the most striking thing that I remember from the first conference I went to, um, which was, I think, actually a Nature Serve, the Biodiversity Without Boundaries conference. Oh, um, awesome. In, in Ottawa, Canada. Um, but I remember going to it and it's about biodiversity. It's about, you know, value in life and differences. Um, and it was the most, like every conference I've been to, to be fair, like such a, a homogeneous crowd. It's full of, you know, older, older white males, mostly. Um, I think there was a, a great representation of women there, but, um, in general, these, you know, the field is, is very, um, uh, non-diverse. Um, and that's something that really, stuck with me. I, I love it. I love the people here that I work with um, and that I get to, to collaborate with across the country in the field. Um, but it's always, it was always really striking for me as I moved through my education from high school to undergrad to graduate school, seeing less and less people of color, less and less Black people um, in the courses and, and in my surroundings around me. Um, and this is something that, you know, as we're realizing now, systems are, are forcing people of color and Black people out of these fields. So I think increasing that inclusion and, and equity in these systems is, is just really critical because um, we need these perspectives to, to make better solutions 
My conversation with Peter only skimmed the surface of a few of the systemic challenges we face when working together across the diversity of all people to protect the diversity of nature. Protecting nature can be challenging on a personal level. We all do things like recycling, but there are cool opportunities to protect species in our own yards that we hadn't necessarily thought of before. I spoke to author and professor of biology at the University of Sussex, Dr. Dave Goulson, who uses insects as an example of biodiversity in peril and what individuals can do to help. People don't really appreciate how important they are. They, they make up the bulk of life on Earth in terms of numbers of species. Uh, we've named about 1.5 million species of animal and plants, and 1.1 million of those are insects. You know, So they are biodiversity. But then they perform all sorts of other kind of really vital ecosystem roles, ecosystem services, they're often called. Uh, so the, the most famous of which is they pollinate um, uh, both wildflowers and 75% of the crops we grow in the world. They're food for a whole raft of birds, bats, and all sorts of other creatures. But they do a whole bunch of other stuff too. Um, you know, they're recyclers, so dead bodies, dead trees, cow pats, leaves, they all get tidied away and broken down with the help of insects. And they help to keep the soil healthy and they distribute seeds and they control crop pests. And basically, you name it, they're busy doing it. You know, we have to think about when we lose these insects. And I have to imagine that some of this is due to um, climate change and some of it is due to habitat loss and fragmentation. And some of it may be to you to uh, due to the use of insecticides and things like that. Actually, that's what's scary about much of this stuff is it's it's happened on our watch. You know, this is this is since I was a kid, we've seen you know a halving of the number of UK butterflies, for example, and and the, the spotted flycatcher is population has fallen by ninety three percent since 1966 when I was one year old. So we've seen some you know really staggering drops in abundance and the good news is that you know you people can get involved you know a, a lot of environmental issues like tropical deforestation or climate change or whatever people do feel quite helpless because your individual actions seem kind of you know um inconsequential but with insects because they live all around us um and they can recover really you know most haven't gone extinct yet and given the right given some habitat they can their numbers can increase really quickly unlike tigers or orangutans or whatever um and and people can do things in their own backyard and see a difference you know within within weeks uh, even days um plant the right flowers plant some native wildflowers some bee friendly flowers and and the insects will come you know if enough people did that and got involved then it, it really would make a difference at NatureServe, we are eternal optimists. If every one of us took a stand in support of biodiversity, we could really make a difference. And so, to end this special holiday episode of Conservation Conversations, I'd like to leave you with a short but powerful clip from the conversation I had with Dr. Lucas Joppa, the Chief Environmental Officer at Microsoft. Over the course of this podcast series, I have asked most guests who I've had the pleasure of speaking with what they'd like their legacy to be. Lucas's response hit close to home. I hope you enjoy it. What, you know, from your perspective, not necessarily from Microsoft's perspective, from but Lucas Joppa, what is your, what is your goal for the, for the future? Well, I set my goal um, pretty modestly, I guess, for me as an individual. And, and people ask me what I want to achieve. And I, I say this, and it, and it is simple. I just want there to be more species on earth when I die than there would have been had I never lived. And I want everybody, I want every organization to think that way. And if we did think that way, the problem wouldn't seem so big, right? Yeah. If there could just be one more species on earth when I die than if, there, you know, than if I hadn't lived that, I would take that, you know? And if everybody in every organization kind of took that perspective, I think we'd be in a much better place. And I think our problems would seem so much smaller than they actually are. Thank you for listening to this special episode of Conservation Conversations. We hope what you heard today will inspire you to seek opportunities in your daily life to engage with science and conservation. Your role is vital as we work together to ensure the future of the planet and ultimately of mankind and nature itself. We're thankful to you, our listeners, and always wanna hear from you. 
Please send an email to info at natureserve.org to submit questions or suggestions for future episodes. And finally, this holiday season, we ask for your support for our mission of conserving biodiversity by visiting us at natureserve.org donate and following us on social media. Thank you and happy holidays.